You know what? There's one advantage of having a newborn baby, is that it makes getting up for the early morning races a heck of a lot easier. Because you're up anyway. You're always up. You never sleep. Anyway, Australia. Now just so you know, there could be some rain during the Grand Prix weekend. Most notably, according to Williams' forecast, around about the time of Free Practice 3, and it may still be damp at the beginning part of qualifying. Now, of course, this could easily change because other forecasts are saying it's going to be sunny throughout the entire event. This could make things a little bit interesting in Q1. We might see some upsets, or we might see Max Verstappen right at the back through some freak circumstance and him having to go through all of the grid like he did when he was racing for Redline at Monza and you saw this expression from him. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> what? And you know the freakiest part of that clip? That was before turn one at Monza. Then there's the speculation regarding Carlos Sainz and his recovery. He might be thinking that, oh, well, two weeks of recovery after a very smooth operation for appendicitis would be enough for him to get back into the car. But there is still some uncertainty as to whether or not he will be in the car for Melbourne and that we might not see him again until Suzuka because his social media activity has been relatively quiet. And also something of note, Alex Albon suffered a similar thing back in 2022 where we saw Nick DeVries step in for him and he then got caught up by Helmut Magpie. And he then said Albon that even when he returned to the car, he still wasn't at 100%. And the only time he could realistically recover was during the off season, which makes sense because it's relentless at the end part of the season. It all depends on the severity of the appendicitis and when it was caught. If it was caught early enough, then we might see him in Melbourne after all. But now people are thinking that we might not see him here and this might be an opportunity for Oliver Behrman to step in and get another chance to do a whole Grand Prix weekend and see him maybe be even closer to Charles Leclerc. Because according to the data, he was getting progressively closer to Charles Leclerc's lap times towards the end of the Jeddah Grand Prix. Whether or not that might be the case here, it's a little bit uncertain. But in terms of just sheer g-forces and downforce it is far less intense than the corniche circuit so this might be a smoother transition and it'll be really interesting to see how he does develop when he gets a little bit more time in the car this might be starting to get a little bit detrimental for his overall formula 2 campaign Behrman hasn't scored in any of the sessions. Now, of course, in Jeddah, he did get pole, but he then he obviously couldn't take part. And that meant that all of the other championship rivals have started to amass a decent amount of points, whereas Berman is right down at the bottom. So it's going to make his campaign a little bit more tricky. And it would be nice for him to win the championship or get a top three position where he is guaranteed a Formula One seat. And yes, of course, it doesn't really matter so much because he does have enough super license points anyway. But it would be nice for him to get a top three finish just to justify further his placement in Formula One. So whether or not it might be Robert Schwartzman or Sainz might be enough to step in, the second Ferrari seat and who's going to be in it is still up for debate as of this recording. But then again, that could easily change for tomorrow and I could be utterly wrong or I could be utterly right. But either way, the speculation does offer a little bit of intrigue. Then we got some comments about the RB20 as to why Red Bull themselves decided to add this much to a car instead of doing another simple evolution of the RB19 like it was of the RB18. But put simply, thanks to its chief engineer Paul Monaghan, they basically thought, well, this is the last roll of the dice. And if we just get out of the way this big development now, we can then focus more on 2026 and just do a simple evolution for 2025, which does make a lot of sense. So what we are seeing here with the RB20 is basically the Zenith car of Red Bull, and then has some slight modifications for the RB21, which according to rumor is practically mostly developed anyway. So we might not see a big change in overall design. This is pretty much what we are going to get as the peak of this era of ground effect from Adrian Newey. It does give me a little bit of hope for 2025 because as some teams start to proclaim that, well, we're not really going to do much development for next year because there's 2026, some other teams probably further down the grid, might decide to go all in for 2025, try and get some more prize money, and then try and develop for 2027 and take a hit for 2026, because they might end up being back at the grid anyway, or they might get some good advantage. So there's a little bit more ambiguity for the next season, and it's just making this season all the more irrelevant. And speaking as a content creator, I really shouldn't be saying it, but come on, I know you're thinking it. 
But this might mean that 2025 might be closer because there will be convergence, despite the fact that Pirelli's thrown a spanner in the works and decided to keep the 18 inch rims instead of going to the rumoured 16 inch rims. But speaking of the tyres, the tyre allocation for this weekend has changed from last year. We are now seeing for the first time the C5 tyre, the softest tyre available from Pirelli. And what makes this all the more interesting is that Yes, it is the softest tyre, we are going to see the most performance, and it will wear out the quickest. But the teams have barely used it. Not even 100 miles was covered in the Bahrain test using the C5 tyre. And it's all very well and good that the spec of tyre has not changed since last year. But the cars have evolved from 2023. So you're getting the brand new car with all the C5 tyres. And whether or not that will actually translate well onto Melbourne and Albert Park, even though the tyre degradation and stress levels are relatively average according to Pirelli's data, there is an unknown there. There is a variable. And I very much like to see what the Haas can do on a C5 tyre. Now, okay, I know this next bit isn't Formula One related, but this is almost uh, karma in a way. And it's got something to do with the Formula E paywall. I was really starting to get interested in Formula E, especially when McLaren took over Mercedes operation and became a proper fully fledged team in themselves and had the proper papaya car. But then TNT Sports acquired the rights, made it lock behind a paywall for 30 quid a month when I'm already paying for Sky Sports F1 with Now TV. And now, wouldn't you know it, the viewing figures are absolutely dire. Not even 100,000 people watching the highlights on YouTube and many of the other videos on their channel getting barely three or four thousand views. There is an outlier there, but if you look at the like count, it's a little bit janky. Let's just say that. I don't want to get into too much hot water, but look for yourself. It's a little bit, um, there's a disparity there, that's for sure. So Formula E is taking a major hit, and I don't think it's really justified the need to go behind a paywall. And it's a huge paywall as well. I mean, the Formula One paywall behind Sky Sports. That's steep in itself, but it has justified it because it is the top tier of single-seater racing. I get why they're doing it, and that's why it's met my damn it price. If you don't know what a damn it price is, by the way, that's the price that you reach your limit where you just go, oh, damn it, fine, I'll pay for it, but you won't pay any more. It's a real shame as well because the last race was really, really intense and McLaren bagged their first win. Way! But barely anybody saw it or the most people that did see it was just the last lap. They just saw a clip, and most of that was on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, I think this was a bad call, Formula E. You took the money way too soon. So, okay, in terms of the overall result, where do we see all of the teams? Well, I don't think it's going to change all that much since Jeddah. It's going to be a tussle for the podium positions between Red Bull and Ferrari. With Carlos Sainz possibly not being here for this race, Behrman may be lucky to get some more points, but it's hard to say and we might see yet another chance for some of the lower teams to bag themselves a point if Behrman does have some problems or if he has a mechanical issue or if he just simply bins it which would be okay because remember he's only 18 and he is perfectly within his rights to make mistakes because Liam Lawson even though people were lauding him as the next great hero of Formula One he made mistakes as well look at Qatar but if that doesn't happen and Behrman puts in yet another flawless race for him we will probably just see the likes of Red Bull, Ferrari, McLaren, Aston Martin and Mercedes jostling for the top 10 points, them scoring a certain amount, probably with Aston Martin bringing up the rear because, you know, they're the fifth fastest car at the moment. But then again, this is Fernando Alonso we're talking about here, so he might pull some surprises like he did in Jeddah when he got fifth. I think Mercedes will be a little bit better this time out because they really struggled in the high speed corners. There are far fewer of those instances in Albert Park, in fact, barely any, which means that in terms of the low speed stuff, where they're a little bit stronger, we might see Mercedes not having to really sweat buckets when it comes to getting into Q3. And we might even see the likes of George Russell getting into the top five. Barely though. But I feel like Lewis, it depends on what he does with his setup. If he decides just to settle for a setup that will suffice and he spends more time in just getting used to the track and the car and having a decent setup, then he might do better and he might get the top five position. But then again, Mercedes are going to use these free practice sessions to experiment with more tweaks to try and discover the fundamental issues they have with the W15, which does not surprise me whatsoever. This is a brand new concept. It's going to take time to understand. They can't rush this. And I get the feeling that Toto is starting to understand that and that patience is the watchword here. We are not going to see that car at its best until maybe Canada. So just wait, Mercedes fans. It will come, just not right now. But then again, if that rain does come true for FP3 and the whole hour is potentially wasted, and even then, if it's only raining for a bit and then it's damp, 
that's a whole hour wasted. And all that experimentation on the Friday will then be leading you to being compromised for getting your race setup down in order. That's a really bit of a risky situation considering there is rain forecast. Whether or not it comes, that remains to be seen, but it is there. But here's hoping that it doesn't and the Mercedes might be a really good car in Sector 3 since the low speed seems to be its advantage. But what about the bottom five teams? Who has the best chance of scoring a point if one of the top five teams either falters, makes a mistake in the pit stops or has a DNF? Well, that is still a little bit vague, but I'm starting to see some sense of pattern. And I think the two most likely teams to score will be Williams and Haas. Because Haas set the tone in Jeddah that they know these bottom five teams, that the only way they're going to score points is to do something bold, something daring, capitalizing on any of the top five teams making a mistake. So you're going to get moments like Magnussen's going F it and then holding up many of the drivers. So that means Nico Hulkenberg can score a point, which according to Nico, he had no idea that any of this was going down. Apparently they didn't tell him. They just let him get on with it. So that means I guess he wasn't pressured or stressed out by Zhou Guan Yu because he was already dealing with him. And then Zhou had an issue with the pit stop and Magnussen was doing all of the heavy lifting. Wow. I actually think that was a really good idea. Don't let Nico get involved. He's already got his own point trying to get a point. So, uh, Good job, Haas. These teams are going to be using desperation tactics, and that's going to make it all the more interesting for those bottom 10 positions, and who might be able to leap a charge for either 9th or 10th. And Williams and Haas are the most likely the ones to do it, because with Williams, according to Alex Albon, he feels a lot more optimistic with the development trend of the FW46. Sure, he's not saying that it's great right now, and that there's still plenty to work from, but the very fact that there is stuff to work on is a massive bonus because for the longest time, the Williams car was just a straight line demon. Williams didn't really know what aerodynamics was, and that was the case for nearly a decade. In fact, maybe even longer. But now they actually know what to do and Alex has to actually overtake in the corners, something he's not really used to after having joined Williams. They can now start to find places where they can develop the car and hopefully then make the car easier for Logan Sargent to keep up with, and then he too might have a chance to score points on the regular. But realistically, it's going to be Alex, but this optimism from Alex, and that he got 11th place in the end of the day, even after him being held up by Magnussen, really gives me some confidence that if any of the teams at the top five do have an issue, Williams might be the one to capitalize on it. Yes, of course, it may not be for big points, but it would be for some points. They certainly look more likely to score on the regular, and this not being a blue moon event. And as for Haas, they're a bit of a dark horse. No one's quite sure what they're up to because their game plan, their strategy right now, sure, it was bold and cheeky and according to Racing Bulls Unsportsmanlike, but it was something that was unexpected. It was a surprise. We got some action. And yeah, they have retroactively said, yeah, maybe we pushed it a little bit too far, but they had to do something to score that point. And lo and behold, currently, they're sixth place in the constructors. And that's the kind of attitude that these teams need to have. But wait, what about Racing Bulls and Sauber? Well, they're still a little bit muddy, given the fact that they've really underperformed, especially the likes of Bottas. I mean, Joe, that's an exception entirely. And as for Alpine, well, currently, they're all about the pain all pain. And like I said, Joe might get a chance to score a point because at the moment he's been putting in some very mature performances. In Bahrain he was 11th and in Jeddah he was 11th before a pit stop issue came a knocking, as did with Bottas, and it's something that Salva really needs to work on, but so far Joe has impressed more than his teammate. But again, I feel like Williams right now, if they're not stuck behind a DRS train, they might be able to make some inroads and be jostling for the 11th and 12th positions, most notably with Alex. But it's still early days. Some of the other teams might catch up at track specific events where it's actually lending an advantage. And that maybe downforce is not as much of an issue as it was in Bahrain and Jeddah. But so far, Williams look like they have a car that they can work with. And that is something really hopeful for any of the Williams fans out there. And then they can mount a campaign to maintain seventh position, which currently they have still. So, so far, they're not doing any worse than they did last year. Okay, when it comes to the racing bulls, it's really hard to say right now. One thing is for sure though, they are underperforming considerably. All of the rhetoric that they were talking about pre-season, about them jostling for fifth place in the constructors, or worst sixth place, with all of the RB19 gubbins and resources that they have acquired, that they are taking the team far more seriously, all the sponsors that they've gained, probably several tens of millions of sponsorship, maybe even hundreds of millions, they look like a legit team now, rather than just the junior outfit, or a case of just advertising another Red Bull company. This is looking like a proper legit team and so far they're not doing much better than they did last year. And the best that they can really hope for and what they've been jostling for in terms of team orders has been 13th. 
13. Now, okay, I know that you might be typing in the comments that those two drivers had a lot of misfortune laid down on them, and you do have a point. Tsunoda, for the longest time, was stuck behind Magnussen, which meant that he was curtailed because he did have a good Q3 result in ninth place, and Ricardo had a one-minute pit stop, which was going against him, but he then did have that spin, which was unprovoked, so it's still quite vague as to the efficacy of the V-Carb 01. We don't quite know its full potential just yet. We might be surprised. They might be right up there with Williams and Haas, maybe. They might be justified in being the sixth fastest team, but so far, we don't know. And that ambiguity is not the kind of tone that Loro Mecki's team, as well as Christian Horner, who's probably been one of the main instigators of getting that team to the way it is right now, that's not exactly what they want. And then when it comes to the drivers, whoa, the drivers, Daniel Ricciardo has had his first warning from Helmut Marco, which is never a good sign, especially when it's just the second race. And then you've got the whole team situation where Ricciardo is trying to play down the tension between he and Yuki, but I'm honestly not buying it whatsoever because there is a lot to play for here. There is the second seat at Red Bull to play for here. And even then, that's still a little bit vague because so far, Checo is doing the business exactly what he needs to do. And if Sergio Perez manages to secure P2 in the driver's standings with several races to spare, as they do with the constructors, then maybe Red Bull might go, hmm, we might not need another driver for another year. And then to top it all off, you've got Liam Lawson banging at the door constantly, him getting more and more aggressive and more feisty with his comments about I should be in Formula One. And especially when you see the likes of Piastri kicking on at McLaren, you get Oliver Behrman stepping in and then doing wonders in a Ferrari and then progressively getting closer to Leclerc. It's just getting clearer and clearer by the day that there are plenty of young drivers out there who can cut their teeth in Formula One and be competent. I really want to see more of that. And I think we might see some more purges as we might see a really feisty Formula Two campaign. We might even see the likes of Bortoletto surprising everybody. And hopefully we might get a Brazilian back on the grid. And then of course, Behrman and Antonelli for Mercedes. We don't know. We can't have another season where these drivers end up in reserve driver purgatory like Drogovic. I'm just that annoyed. So I think both Sonoda and Ricardo should be worried because Lawson is now starting to get punchy. I don't think that the likes of Peter Bayer and Laura Meckes will be as forgiving because there's a lot more attention, there are a lot more sponsors at play, and if the sponsors don't like what the team is able to pump out in terms of results, they will flee. They will go to other teams or just settle back at the top team. So these two drivers need to step it up. And this head to head is one of those that you really need to keep an eye on. All right, okay. On to the main predictions. Now, when it comes to the top five, I think you know what I'm going to say. Max Verstappen is going to take the win because he seems quite calm. He seems quite chill. And when asked when he was actually going to be heading to the Melbourne Grand Prix, he basically said, eh, maybe tomorrow. He wasn't really setting up a really good structure as to arriving. And I really don't see the RB20 getting any worse unless it has a mechanical issue. But I could be saying that every single race. It depends on whether he has a DNF or not with the car letting him down, which it probably won't. So. To say that Max Verstappen won't be in the chance of winning, that would be quite unreasonable. And it will probably be Charles Leclerc going for second place because right now it's going to be something that we saw for 2022 that at the beginning part of the season, we'll probably see Leclerc in second place for Ferrari since it's not quite clear whether or not Carlos Sainz will be competing as of now. If Carlos Sainz is in here, then he'll probably be in the top five as well. But I'm going with the fact that maybe we might see Robert Schwartzman or Oli Behrman or somebody else taking the second Ferrari seat. But Charles Leclerc, second place, I do think so. And then it will be Checker for third, but it will be very close, probably within like maybe three or four seconds or something. It will depend on whether or not the Red Bull team can get a good pit stop or not. It's going to be that tight. Now, in terms of fourth place, I'm going to take a punt here. and I'm going to say that the other Australian, Oscar Piastri, will be fourth place. The McLaren seems to be quite interesting where it is. And the likes of Jeddah really filled me with some optimism that Oscar Piastri has kicked on over the winter that he has been able to drive more maturely. And with his battle with Lewis Hamilton, he was able to keep those hard tires on track for quite a while. But then again, we might see Lando in fourth place, but this home advantage, which sometimes can be upwards of half a second a lap, might be enough for Oscar to really show some promise because right now, because of Ricardo's wobbles, I think Oscar is the main Australian driver to keep an eye on. Well, yeah, of course, Valtteri Bottas is there too. In terms of fifth place, I think it's going to be George Russell because he seems to be the person who's a little bit more adaptable with the W15. He's able to make do and mend with that car. 
having had plenty of experience with really bad cars at Williams through 2019 and 2021, and therefore being able to make a mountain out of a molehill or some other analogies which are probably a little bit too savoury for YouTube. But either way, he seems to be a little bit more adaptable and versatile, whereas Lewis Hamilton isn't quite as such. So we'll probably see the likes of maybe Russell and then Hamilton in sixth place or something jostling with Norris for seventh. Right now, McLaren and Mercedes are the third and fourth fastest teams. They're going to be jostling for that third place slot until McLaren kick on with their upgrade and then they go after Ferrari. But right now, it could be anybody's guess for fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh. But you'll probably be wondering why I'm not talking about Alpine at all. Why are they not really featuring in my reviews whatsoever? Well, go and watch this video next about why Ryan Reynolds' team is a bit of an embarrassment for Formula One right now. And if you're wondering why I'm not calling them Alpine, it's a joke. The tabloids call it such, so uh, that's the joke, and they're a joke.